he two together to see a more fuller picture. I tell you in that night, there shall be two men in one bed. The one should be taken and the other left. And actually in the Greek, the word men is not there. It's added by the translator. It actually trans reads, that night shall two be in the bed. One shall be taken, the other left. Two women should be grinding together. One will be taken and the other left. Two men will be in the field. One shall be taken and the other left. When you read this verse of scripture, there are three basic interpretations that people will give you as to what Christ is alluding to. The first interpretation is this. That some suggest that this deals with when the Roman soldiers were coming into Judea and they were capturing certain Jews and other Jews were escaping the Romans from 66 AD to 70 AD. So there are some people that suggest that this verse has already taken place. The second interpretation that some people have is that this happens at the end of the seven year tribulation period. And what ha is happening here is those who have the mark of the beast are not permitted to rule and reign with Christ, Christ, so they are taken off of the earth and the, there are others who remain on the earth. And that sounds like a logical interpretation until you go back to the context of what Matthew and Luke are actually talking about that they recorded when Jesus said this. Number three, this is the moment of the rapture, the moment of the gathering together, the moment of that dead in Christ being caught up to be with the Lord in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17. Because notice specifically that it says in that night, this will happen. So it's not a spread out event of the Romans coming into Judea for days and days and taking some and releasing others. Neither is it a reference to taking people with the mark of the beast off because it's, it is it's dealing with here, as I'm going to prove to you, the coming of the Lord. Now, what we're going to do in the next few moments, and I realize if you see an excerpt of this on manifest, you're not going to get all this teaching. That upsets some people, but look, I've only bought airtime for a 28 and a half minute program. And this message is 70 to 75 minutes in length. So it's impossible to do it all. Unless you want me to talk like this, and when I talk like this, you're going to complain, you're going to say, why well, didn't you slow down? <laughs> the question I'm going to be asking delves into three realms today. Number one, what about carnal Christians? Are they going to be raptured? Number two, if a Christian woman is pregnant, whether it be two weeks, two months, what happens to the newborn infant or the infant that is in her womb the moment her body is changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye? And the third question I'm going to ask, which I think a lot of people have questions about this. If I'm a believer and I have a, domestic, a d domesticated animal, an animal such as a cat or a dog that's very dear to me because I have no children, then if I'm raptured, what is going to happen to my pet? if there's no one to care for it. Would anybody like to have these questions answered to the best of the ability to the word of God? Let's give him a praise if you want to try at least to see if we can answer these questions in this session today. The first thing you have to understand anytime you're interpreting the scripture is the scripture in the context of what is being taught right before that verse and what is being taught right after that verse. Because anytime you have a scripture and you take it out of context, it becomes a pretext. And people try to form a doctrine off of one verse and take it out of the setting of which it was written. We have to understand the setting of Luke 17 verses 24 through 29 and say, what is Jesus talking about when he talks about being taken or being left? And the answer is he's speaking about his return and how swift it's going to be. In Luke 17, 24, he says it's going to be like lightning. As lightning shines from one end of heaven until the other end of heaven, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. But he also mentions two time frames. He mentions in Luke 17, 26 through 29, old Dr. Luke recorded that Jesus starts talking about the days of Noah. And he also starts mentioning here the days of Lot. And he gives the signs of eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, building, planting, and so forth. So it's saying that life is going on as normal, but suddenly it's interrupted. And that interruption will immediately completely change things. In Luke 17, 27, he identifies that Noah is secure in the ark with his family and suddenly, unexpectedly, the flood hits and takes them all away. He took them away, in this instance, meaning the world, through the death of the flood waters. Then we come into Luke chapter 17, 29. He also mentions Lot. And he mentions how that Lot is taken out of Sodom. And the same day that Lot is taken out of Sodom, the judgment begins on the cities. And it rains down fire and brimstone from God out of heaven. 
Now, another gospel writer mentions these same things that we're talking about, and it's Matthew. Matthew's gospel, if we go to Matthew 24, 37 through 51, he says the same things basically that Luke says. However, Matthew talks of Lot, but he does not mention, I'm sorry, he talks of Noah, but Matthew does not mention Lot. He talks about two in the field. He talks about two grinding at the mill. And he says the same thing. And these are the words of Jesus, of course. One is taken, but the other is left. Now, Matthew 24 and verse 36 adds these words. Of the day and the hour knoweth no man, know not the angels, but my father only. So he's referring to here the swiftness and the suddenness and the unexpected reality of the moment he comes. Then we find in Matthew 24 and 42, Matthew adds these words. And when, when I say he adds these words, this is not Matthew making something up. He's adding the other words that Jesus spoke that the other gospel writer did not mention. And that confuses some people, but it would be like if I were to say, what did you get out of my message tonight? This group will say the first half of it, something there. This group will say, man, right in the middle when Perry said that. And that group will say, man, that story he told at the end. So if I ask you to write what you got out of the message, it's the same message, but different people hear different key elements in it. This is why the gospel writers will tell the same story, but one will appear to add something that the other gospel writer did not because when they heard it, there was a certain emphasis that struck their spirit when they wrote their epistle or their gospel, we would say. So watch carefully. Matthew 24 and 42 says, watch for you do not know the hour that your Lord does come. So here's the key. The one taken and the other left has nothing to do with the separation of the wheat and the tear at the end of the tribulation or those that have the mark or don't have the mark. And I've heard that taught by great TV preachers, but I have to totally disagree with that interpretation. And here's why. Because in Luke chapter 12, verse 39, there is a goodman in a home. And a goodman was the person who controlled the estate. They were the head person in that estate. They were over everything. And it said, now the goodman, if he would have known the hour that his house would have been broken up, he would have never, or he would have been watching and been prepared. Now, it's interesting that when the writer of Luke, or, or we would say in Luke chapter 12, Luke was the writer, when he begins to mention the house being broken up, in Greek, it means to be burglarized. It means to break it up through a burglary. Now, someone said, well, Jesus isn't a burglar. Then why did Paul say he's coming like a thief in the night? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 4, the coming of the Lord is compared to a thief who enters a house, takes what he wants before the people in the home realize that that thief has showed up and taken that which he took. So if we look at this again, someone has been taken from the goodman's house. So who is taken and who is left? The answer is the goodman wasn't taken. He wasn't taken anywhere. He remained where he always was, in the house and in the estate. But someone in the house had been taken with the unexpected appearance of what we would say the thief or the burglar. So in this context of Luke, we find out that what is happening here is Jesus is trying to make this very clear. That when I come, it's going to be quick. It'll be like a thief coming, but I will take some with me and I will leave others on earth that will not go with me. And that's why two are in the field, one's taken the other left, two are sleeping, one's taken in the other left. So I do not believe this is a, a, you know, a post-trib scripture about the separation of the sheep and the goat and wheat and tear. I believe it's a rapture scripture. And I'm going to delve a little further. I hope to prove to you that it's a rapture scripture. I want you to take a, a look at the New Testament Koine Greek words for taken uh, and the word for left, especially the word taken. Now, let me give you a little bit of study here that I think you're going to find very interesting. The word taken is used both in Luke's gospel and also in Matthew's gospel. In the New Testament English translation, you can find the word taken 68 times. And what's interesting is there are different Greek words. If I say the word, well, it was taken, then you will think in English there was something that existed that's no longer there because someone took it, right? In Greek, however, listen to this. This is crazy. There can be numerous meanings for the word taken. Uh, you can pick up something 
uh, from a uh, room and it's been taken. You can carry something that belongs to someone else and you took it. You can rob someone and it's taken. So in other words, you have to go back to the word in its original Koine Greek and find out what does that particular word mean? Are you ready for this? Here, here's, here's what I want to tell you. In Matthew and Luke's gospel, while there are 68 different times the word taken is used, and in the Greek language there are different meanings, in Luke and Matthew, this word taken is the same Greek word. Now listen carefully. It is the word paralambano, and it means, quote, to take or to receive near. To take, some, we're going somewhere, to take something, and in this case someone, and receive them near. Five times when this word paralambano is taken as the word receive, as the word, or when it's translated as the word taken, let me say it again because I don't want to get you confused here. When this word paralambano is used in the New Testament, five times where it's translated taken, all five times refers to the return of the Lord. But that's not the best part. That's only a part. In John 14, let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, you believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go prepare a place for you. And if I go prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Are you ready for this? The phrase, I will come again and receive. Everybody say receive. receive. You unto myself. Receive is found in 128 verses in the English translation of the New Testament. There are also different meanings in Greek for that. It's just really a unique that when Jesus said, I will receive you, the Greek word is paralambano. Meaning, this could be translated, I will come again and take you unto myself. Now this is why the scripture is of no private interpretation. This is why you don't just pick and choose a verse in English and make it think what you want it to say. If you really want to know how to read the Bible, you're going to have to study Hebrew and read the Old Testament the way Bill does in Hebrew, seriously, or be able to do word studies in Hebrew. Or if you want to understand the New Testament, you're going to have to take a Greek class. And we have that, by the way, at ISO, Greek classes, where you can learn Greek. And when you learn Greek, you can put the words and the nuances and all the different parts of the Greek language together. And this is why you just don't read it. You go back and study it. Now, what I'm trying to say to you is this, that when you take John 14, verses 1 through 3, and you take what Matthew said that Jesus said about one taken and the other left, you take what Luke says about one taken and the other left, the Greek word is the same. So in other words, what Jesus is talking about there is this. That in, now, th this is really neat because you remember something back in the Roman day, as far as the Roman people knew, or as far as, let's say, the disciples of Jesus knew, the world was basically Africa and, the Roman, and, 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 the, uh, and Europe, uh, uh, Asia. They didn't know anything about Japan back then. They didn't know anything about Canada, the United States, and Latin America. And here's something else they didn't know. As far as they were concerned in that part of the world, when the sun was shining, it was shining everywhere. When it was nighttime, it was nighttime everywhere. But notice what Jesus says that's a revelation. Two will be working. One will be taken and the other left. And then over here, two will be sleeping. Are oh, y'all getting what I'm trying to tell you? Two will be sleeping. One taken and the other, which means that when the coming of the Lord takes place, it will be work time in one part of the world. It will be people sleeping in another part of the world. And notice in both instances, someone is taken out of that house and out of that bed. Someone is taken out of that field and someone remains. So I would suggest to you very strongly that this reference has to do with Jesus coming in what we term, the theological term we use, is the rapture. 
Now, I have three questions that in this message I'm going to answer. And I want to say something to the audience. Please do not send me emails asking me to explain what you did not see on the program. Because I know when I get ready to say these three questions, we're going to answer, will carnal Christians go to heaven or are they the foolish virgins of Matthew? Will an infant in the womb be taken with its Christian mother and will pets of Christians somehow be removed? The first thing we deal with today is the question of this. What about carnal Christians? Now, someone says, well, there's no such thing as a carnal Christian. Well, you haven't read what Paul wrote, apparently. There are people who pray a prayer of repentance to accept the Lord. Yet from that moment when they leave the church, they never show up to church again. They never follow anything in the Bible. They never study the Bible. They never give and basically never attend church. But yet, if they were to drop dead, the preacher will preach them into heaven because 25 years ago they prayed a prayer. There are people who go to church, but yet what happens in services never changes them. They basically live the same way as when they were in sin, meaning they're just doing the same things that they did when they were a sinner, but now they say, I'm a Christian, but they're doing the same thing. So we have a problem here. There are those who say, I'm a Christian, but their words and actions are very fleshly and they're very self-centered. First thing you have to ask yourself about will a carnal Christian go in the rapture is you have to identify really what is a Christian because a lot of people call themselves Christians. Let me, I was in, I was in Egypt one time and I asked, I met a man named Mark. I said, well, that's a Bible name. He said, yes, I'm a Christian. I said, where do you go to church? He says, I don't. I said, when were you baptized? He says, I wasn't. And I said, well, how can, how can you say you're a Christian? He said, in Egypt, if you're not a Muslim, they automatically think you're a Christian. So he wasn't a Muslim and because he wasn't a Muslim, they just gave him that name, his family did, and he had never really accepted the Lord as his savior. So when you ask what, what a Christian is, you have to ask, ask yourself, define a true Christian. To define a true Christian goes like this. If you love me, Jesus said, you will keep my word. Jesus said, if you love me, you will do what I said. Jesus said, you should watch and pray to be accounted worthy to escape what is coming in the earth and to stand before me. The Lord Jesus said, love the Lord thy God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. The biggest thing to me about identifying a Christian is a statement that Paul made. If any man, and that's woman too, is in Christ, they are a new creation. All things are passed away. All things are become new. Now, if a year after you said you're saved, you're still using the same profanity, still watching the same pornography, still bound up with the same addictions, there's something wrong with either your heart or your confession. Because the heart man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth, confession's made to salvation. See, this is very important that you understand what James says, starting in James chapter three and verse 10. He said this, you cannot produce a fountain that has bitter and sweet water at the same time. You cannot make a tree grow figs and olives at the same time. You cannot have fresh water and salt water at the same time. You cannot put oil and water in the same vessel. It separates immediately. So you have to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, be loving him. There's your key. Do you love him? Do you love him enough to go to his house? Do you love him enough to attend the house of God, to worship, to help people? What, what is in your heart? Look, I'm gonna say something and I may be getting ahead of myself. I learned a long time ago that we judge people outwardly, but God said to Samuel, don't look on the outward appearance. For man looks on the outward appearance, God looks upon the heart. I remember most of the people I grew up with were sanctified, holy people. And I remember, though, a preacher saying to a group of his church members, he said, I got a few of you women in this church that's got a tongue so long you could wrap it around the front door three times. <laughs> and it was true. They looked good on the outside, but inwardly something was not right with their attitude. Anybody went to that church along with me? Come on. Anybody been to that church? Yeah, just some of you have. Okay, some of you still go to that church, I can tell by looking at you. James 4 and 4 says, friendship with the world is enmity against God. Romans 8, 6 says, 
to be carnally minded is death. Romans 8, 7 says, the carnal mind is enmity against God. And then Galatians 5 and 7 says, the flesh wars against the spirit. So if a person is acting carnal as a Christian, there will be a war going on on the inside of you. How many know what I'm talking about? If you're a true Christian and you ever say or do anything wrong, you will immediately sense conviction. There are young preachers in the pulpit that never want me or someone like me to ever talk about sin, the blood of Jesus, cleansing, righteousness and unrighteousness because it makes my people uncomfortable. Let me tell you, if people are on their way to hell, somebody needs to make them uncomfortable. This is, this is eternity we're talking about here. This is not a game. Now watch what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 7, I'm sorry, 927. It says, I fight. Then Paul says, I run. Then he says this, I have to keep my body under subjection. Now, if you want to know the real Koine Greek of keep my body under subjection, it is, I beat my body black and blue to make it do the right thing. Now, what we call that is discipline. 2 Corinthians 7 to 1 says, let us cleanse ourselves from filthiness of the flesh and spirit. See, there's some things God delivers you from and some things you deliver yourself from. Did you hear what it said? Let us cleanse ourselves. My temper is not God's problem. It's mine. And sometimes I have to shut up and sometimes you need to shut up. Matthew 7, 13, let us labor or strive to enter in at the straight gate. There's a striving. That's a military term in Greek time. It's, it's a battle. You got to struggle to stay on the straight road. You got to struggle to stay on the straight street. Hebrews 12 and 1. Here, here's another one. Let us lay aside the weight and the sin. Now, by the way, that in Greek, the sin means a pet sin. And there are some Hebrew or Jewish people. He is in the midst of his disciples. There is a mixed group. Somebody say mixed group. And when you're with a mixed group of people, you're going to have mixed beliefs and you're going to have mixed ideas and mixed religious beliefs. So suddenly God speaks from heaven in an audible voice, but the reaction to this audible voice is really strange. John chapter 12, verse 29, the people therefore that stood by and heard it, everybody heard it, said that it thundered. Others said, an angel has spoke to him. Jesus said, the voice came not because of me, but came for your sake. It says specifically, God spoke. It says that some said it was an angel. And others thought it was the noise of thunder, like a thunderstorm. How can God speak and three different people hear three different things? The answer is, how can people read their Bible and get nine interpretations? I can take you to 1 Corinthians 13, for an example, and prove to you that speaking in tongues will continue until the Lord returns. But there are churches that will take you to the same verse where Paul said, when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part is done away with, and try to convince their congregation that that which is in part is speaking in tongues, and that the Bible being completed by the fourth century is that which is perfect. So now that we have a New Testament with 27 books, we don't need tongues anymore. How can I get two opposing opposite interpretations? The key in this passage is this. It is not the fact mm -hmm, that they didn't hear the sound. Everybody there heard a sound. The fact is not everybody heard the voice. If I would have had this town in Cleveland in here last night and they would have sat through two hours of worship, some would have left saying, I have never seen such demonstrative emotionalism in what is classified as a church service in my life. They heard a noise, but didn't hear the voice. Others would say, 
well, it's worship, but it's just not my thing. But I don't know why you have to go so long with it. They heard the noise, they heard the sound, but they did not hear the voice. How can you worship in a service? Have you lost your mind for one hour and 50 minutes? Why don't you ask the four living creatures that are around the throne of God from the beginning of creation, one like an ox, one like an eagle, one like a man, mm -hmm, and one like a lion, who all they have ever done since the foundation of this world and before is say the same thing over and over, and it's like this, holy, 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 ho read your Bible. In Isaiah, heard him crying holy, and that was 850 years before John ever heard him crying holy. And believe it or not, while we're sitting here right now, having a preaching moment with God in the Word, they're still crying holy. When you drive home, they be crying holy. When you sleep in the bed at night, they still going to be crying holy. Do you think they get bored saying the same thing over and over again? Do you get bored with the same worship song you've heard a hundred times? Do you get bored? I don't. With Remnant doing, he turned it, and I've seen it probably 50 times. Never gets old to me. But let me tell you the difference of, of something being boring and old and the difference of something being exciting. You can cry the same praise, hallelujah, all your life, and it makes a difference when the four living creatures because they are in the presence of God while they are worshiping God. You see, you can't go on for two hours when the presence is not there. You can't go on for two hours when there's no anointing there. You can't go on for two hours when the glory is not there. You be looking at your watch in 20 minutes saying, get me out of here. I got to get to Panera Bread for lunch. But when the Lord shows up like he did last night and you are in the presence of God, you can stand there and say, holy, 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 for two hours and you're not bored. You can say, hallelujah, 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 for three hours and you're not bored. And I'm trying to tell you something, that the difference between the people that heard the voice of God and the ones that said it sounded like thunder is there was a group that had been in the presence and there was a group that had not been in the presence. So... The thought came to me about when I spent 45 minutes ago, the thought came to me to share with you on how to follow the inner voice of the Spirit of God. Because my daddy, who was one of the, he was the greatest praying man I ever knew. When he was older and had a cane and he come into my office and here I am writing a book. I have to concentrate. I'm in a flow. He'd hold up his left hand like this and say, now brother, you know my dad never called me Perry. He called me brother. He called me, my wife, he never, did he never call you Pam? What did we call you, honey? Tell him about Rilla. Sister. I'm brother. She is sister. Come on. I'm Perry Jr. That's Pam, dad. Come on, get with it. He would say, brother, I think we need to have a word of prayer. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. There were times I was ready and there were times I was frustrated. I said, now he's going to pull me right out of this flow. I got a revelation and I have a little bit of autism. I'm a little bit of ADD. So if I'm on a focus, I got to stay on that focus or I'll lose it. Robbie knows this. I got to text you at three in the morning, Robbie, to let you know at seven o'clock we got to do something. Ain't that right, Robbie? Because if I don't get it out of my mind, I will forget it and then I'll frustrate myself. And there were times he would pray. But dad's word of prayer was an hour. words of prayer <laughs> and he started off praying the lord's prayer and he prayed for everybody he knew and then he go off and praying in tongues he come back to english praying in tongues and i'm gonna tell you if you ever got with but here's the thing about my dad my dad could hear from the lord better than anybody i ever saw in my life and let me tell you what this results in your life as a teenager ready when your dad has a keen ear to hear, you can't sin. No, no, I ain't kidding. Because your dad will walk in, which he did in Salem, Virginia. He'd say, son, I need to talk to you a minute. I had a dream. Oh, God. You're saying to yourself, how far did the dream go, you know? 
There's, there's three things that I want to tell you real quick. One, how does a person hear from God? Because God does not necessarily say, I am the Lord. Oh, did you hear that? <laughs> Woo! He's here. God's in the house. He doesn't necessarily do that. But he speaks, as Elijah said, in a still, small voice. Moses knew God face to face, and God spoke audibly with him. And Elijah, Moses is the meekest man, and he gets the voice. Elijah is the boldest man, he gets the still small voice. And most of the time when God has ever spoke to me, it would be in a nudge or a suddenly. A suddenly is I've got my mind totally on something else, and I suddenly hear the Lord speaking out of my spirit. This building was built because sitting at the Voice of Evangelism Ministry Center one day, writing a book, minding my business, in the middle of doing a Greek word study, I hear coming out of me. I say to God, well, Lord, what would you have me? I'm just typing. What would you have me do if you tarry the next 20 years or so? What do you want me to do? I can be happy doing everything I'm doing. And all of a sudden, the suddenly happened. Remember the Bible says, and suddenly there was a sound from heaven. Acts chapter 2. So suddenly I heard the voice. And I heard, do you want to go where I'm going? And I stopped. I said, ho, ho. Now that's God talking out of me. That's the Holy Spirit in my spirit communicating to my intellect something, and I just heard it. Now I didn't hear, do you want to go where I'm going? Oh, look, if I'd have done that, I'd have fallen out in the power and had a heart attack. You understand? <laughs> I'd, have, I'd have ran out of that building. People said, well, I want to hear God. You want to hear God? You want to see an angel? Everybody in the, in the Bible that saw an angel fell out like they were dead. People, people, people hear me preach every night. Oh, Barry, while you were preaching, I saw a 20-foot angel on one side with a flaming sword. And I saw a 10-foot angel on the other side. And he had a shield. And those angels were fighting over you. And it's like, he it was just the most wonderful thing. No, you did not. You imagine that in your mind. Because if you would have seen a 20-foot angel and a 10-foot angel standing beside me, you would have screamed and fallen out and rolled on the floor and spoke in tongues the rest of your life. You'd have never come back to English after seeing something like that. So I'm sitting there and I hear, do you want to go where I'm going? And I stop. Now listen, when you hear that we call it the inward nudge and suddenly or the voice coming out of your spirit, stop what you're doing. If you're at work, say, I got to take a bathroom break and go to the bathroom and just get still for a minute. Because if that is that real, you're about to get a follow-up message. Touch a neighbor, say follow-up message. So the first message is, do you want to go where I'm going? Yes was the answer. Here's the follow-up marriage. Uh, follow-up, um, yeah. <laughs> marriage, where'd that come from? Somebody getting married. I got a word of knowledge. Somebody about to get married. If I had somebody about to get married. Right here. My Lord, it's working already. Working already. Here's the follow-up message. Ready? Here's the follow-up message. I want you to father a generation that has no fathers. And I want you to build a gathering place for a generation. This was a hill and a field. There was nothing here, and I did not own this property when God said that. Long story made short, it's been how many years now, Robbie? Eight? Eight years. Through a process of eight years to get everything to the point of where it is right now, our prayer barn ministry. ISO, International School of the Word, Omega Center International. Everything that's going on that relates to ministry, it's taken eight years to get Warrior Fest started four years ago. So four years into it, God gives the title Warrior Fest. And that's a story in itself. I'm talking about hearing. I'm talking about learning to listen. So when you hear that sudden, suddenly, like an inner voice, see, people say, well, that was just my conscience talking to myself. Well, what do you think the Holy Ghost does? <laughs> you have a subconscious, and that operates when you're sleeping. And you have a consciousness that operates when you're awake. Can I talk to you? What do you think? What do you think when you do something really bad? What do you think conviction is? It's working on what? Your conscious. And it's on your mind. So how does God speak? God often speaks out of your spirit to your conscious. And you'll start hearing words. You'll start hearing something. And you'll say to yourself, now where'd that come from? You'll get, you'll get, someone will say, just get in your car right now and start driving. I don't want to drive. I don't want to drive. God, I'm busy. I'm in my old, old office before anything was here, before that VOE building was here. And I'm in my office and I have been looking for a building 
and I can't find a building in town. We have outgrown our building, 7,500 square feet, and I have to have a building. I have to have it now. So I said, God, I need property. I looked all over this town, and I'm sitting at my desk writing a book. I need to write more books. God speaks to me when I write books. Dear Jesus, I need another one. And I hear a voice say, get in your car. And I went, out of my spirit, into my mind, into my conscience, get in your car. I thought, I'm not getting in my car. That's crazy. Get in your car and drive. I want to show you something. So Pam will remember this. I go to Pam. She's in the other office. I said, honey, let's get in the car. Well, honey, I got to do bookkeeping. I know you got to do bookkeeping. I had the Lord. Remember this, babe? I said, I had the Lord tell me, get in the car. So we get in the car. And you know what we do? We end up driving to this end of town on Michigan Avenue that I had lived here back then probably 15 years and didn't know existed. And I took a left on Michigan and there is 20 acres of property with a white house. And guess who's selling it? A man that I know whose brother is on my board. I said, uh-oh, uh-oh, there's the property. She said, what do you mean? I said, that's the property. We're going to build on this property. I called the man. The man called a family. You all better hear this. The family named Swafford's met with me. And they said, all right, Mr. Stone, we understand you'd like to buy these 20 acres. What you going to do with it? I said, well, I'm a minister. Oh, really? I thought, uh-oh, I stuck my foot in my mouth there. <laughs> what you going to do, build a church? No, it's not a church. It's a ministry center, really. And I started talking about TV, all the ministries, and I said one word, and the man starts crying. And I said, and we have a missions program. He went, what? A missions program. He starts crying. He said, and we're standing in the field, and there's a white house. He said, you see that white house? I said, yes, sir. He said, that's the house where my mama raised me and a bunch of other kids. My mama was Baptist. We're Baptist. And the Baptist in my day didn't believe at all in women preachers. And my mama felt called to the mission field and never got to go. And said so she stood there on that porch and rocked in a chair and looked over this field when it would grow high grass and pray for the harvest. You better hear what I'm saying. He said, Honey, Bubba, what would they want? $225,000, if I'm not mistaken, or two twenty. dollars 20. They said, let me talk to the family. He called the family up. He called me back. He said, not only do we think mama who's in heaven would like to have a place on our property where the gospel goes around the world, but our mama who never got to be a missionary in heaven would like for us to sell it to you because you're going to win souls that she never got to reach. And we have decided to drop the price by four forty thousand dollars so that you can get it and somebody else won't and there's two buildings over there right now where the gospel goes around the world where a woman in a white house had a prayer meeting but what watch this now what would have happened if i would have said i ain't got time for that now think about it that property would have sold to somebody else that property connects to this property. Oh, see, I would have never been here. You better hear me now. So here's the point. You think it's important to obey God in big things. I've come by to tell you it's the little things that's more important than the big things. It always is. It's that one rock that's a little rock that killed Goliath. My dad has said before he died, I heard him say this, one of the greatest quotes, this is a tweetable quote, everybody can learn how to pray, but not everybody knows how to hear. So what I'm asking you to do is teach yourself, and I'm going to show you how to do it, the process, of how to train your ear to hear from the Lord. First of all, when you want to hear from God, you need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit dwelling in you is the one that gets the downloads directly from the Father in heaven to drop them into your spirit. So the first thing is be filled with the Spirit. And here's the second thing, real simple. The second thing is you have to study the Word so that if you hear a voice, Jesus said, my sheep hear and know my voice, and a stranger's voice they will not follow. And a second verse says this, try the spirits to see if they are of God. 
There are things that the enemy would tell you to do that God would not tell you to do, and there's things God would tell you to do that the enemy would not tell you to do. For example, when you go to give an offering, and you got $20, two tens, and you feel like giving 10, and something says, don't give that, that ain't God. That's either flesh or something else. All right? If you say, you know what, there's a man over there, and I just feel like I'm supposed to go witness to him, but I don't know if that's God or the devil. Oh, come on, get real. <laughs> so the devil going to send you over there to witness to a man about Jesus, right? <laughs> I mean, some things, it is a no-brainer. You do not even have to have the discerning of spirits to understand that if it's something that's going to bring help to somebody, money for someone, help the poor, help the needy, visit the guy in prison. If you know what the Bible says and you suddenly feel an urge to do it, then you know that you are in line with the Word of God. Hello. So you don't have to question the things that you know are in the Word of God. So one is to be filled with the Spirit. And number two, again, is to know the Word because you need to know when God is speaking to you that it is him speaking in line with the word. And number three is, you have to pray. Now listen, this is important. Paul said, pray that the eyes of your understanding will be opened. But I will suggest to you, being someone that has learned this over many years, you must pray that God will open the ear of your spirit. Because too many people have what the Bible calls dull hearing. Hello. Hello. Waxed ears and dull hearing. So you've got to put your hands up here and say, do it right now. Say this. Put your hands over your ears and say this. Dear Jesus, open my spiritual ears to hear from you out of my spirit and to know your voice. It is important to learn this. It's very important for you to learn this early because we're living in a very dangerous world. And God will spare you from danger if you'll learn to listen. My dad is driving one night to Ohio to see his parents, and he's left rather late at night. It's late. He needs a restroom stop. There's not a gas station, so he sees a rest stop. He pulled up to a rest stop and noticed there was a van with tinted windows. As he cuts the key off, he had a word of knowledge, and he hears, Son, there are four hippies in that van waiting for someone to go to the restroom so they can rob them. If you go to the restroom, they're coming in there and they're going to rob you and hurt you physically. You're going to be hurt. And they're going to take all the money you got. So he had a word of knowledge. Put the key in, start the car, jump in, lock the door with your elbow and get out now. So my dad very quickly does those things. And when he hit the lock with his elbow, it was an old car, put it in reverse. Four hippies jumped out of the van. And when they jumped out the side door, they started running toward his car and he already had it backwards. I mean, reverse. And then he, he said, God, what do I do? Now, this is my dad talking. He said, I don't know if it was God or me, but I heard the words, put the pedal to the metal. <laughs> so I had to ask him this. Did you run over any of them? He said, brother, all I know is I put the pedal to the metal. <laughs> 